my friends, welcome back. This is the uh, Build Live stage. My name is Seth, and no pressure for me because uh, this is my boss, and then my boss's boss. And so today's a really good day to maybe, uh, how's it going, my friends? So Eric and Asha, why don't you introduce yourselves? We'll start with you and then Asha. Uh, so I'm Eric Boyd. I lead the AI platform team. Asha, I lead product for the AI platform team. So let's start with what is the now of AI, because there's a lot of stuff going on, and maybe you can help us rationalize it. Want to get your thoughts, and then Asha on product, how, how that looks. I mean, there's so much going on in AI, and I think some of the most exciting things to think about are, what are our customers doing? And so if I start with, like, Mercedes-Benz, you know, everyone's been in a car and has tried to talk to that car voice interface, and it doesn't understand you and can't say anything back. Mercedes-Benz integrated with GPT-4 for their MBUX, and so now you can have a much more natural conversation in the car, being able to like get directions and get things done. They even integrated GPT-4 Vision into the dash cam, so now they can see things going on around the car and near you, and so it's those exciting things like that, and, and you can go from like, car manufacturers all the way to like developers with the Unity platform, which is now made a bot that can help developers figure out all the things that you're doing on Unity. Unity is a platform for making right. 3D games, and so helping you figure out all their APIs and how everything works, all within the Unity environment and not having to leave. And so when you look at those two extremes of just how much these applications are just all over the place, it just shows you how quickly companies are adopting AI across the spectrum. And so we're just building tools as quickly as we can to try and serve those needs. I mean, you know, teams need, uh, companies need things like search to be yep. able to get their data in and, and sort of store it. So Azure AI Search, which is now, you know, 12 times as much storage for the same price, like really all integrated in. The Azure AI Studio making it easy. I mean, there's just so much going on in AI, just really bringing all those applications together. It's really fun and exciting to see. Yeah, it almost feels like applications today are feeling increasingly broken when they don't have AI as part of it. And so we're starting to see organizations go from experimentation now to scale and, you know, even think about customizing the experiences. So a lot of the tools that we're working on are going towards how do they fine tune, how do they, you know, leverage data to ground their application and things like that. What are some cool things that uh, people are doing now that, that you're getting a sense for? Because we talk about AI all the time and everyone's like, AI, AI, you know, but but what are some things that people are doing to sort of soften the edge around software and hardware and people? I mean, you just see it in all the different use cases, right? I mean, I, I talked about a couple where we see what Mercedes-Benz and, and Unity is doing, um, but there's so many other examples where, you know, they're trying to build solutions to make it easier to interact with people. I love the example Satya gave in his keynote this morning of the Khan Academy. Uh, you know, the ability to have an individualized education tutor really connecting directly with each student is really powerful and the types of things that they just, they're the applications you couldn't even have really dreamed of, you know, a few years ago until AI really got to this point. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think multimodal is becoming a big aspect of that. And so now with the power of GPT-4.0, um, which is GA today on Azure OpenAI and Azure AI Studio, I think there's going to be a new world of possibilities to actually inter interact with your AI much more fluently than ever before. Yeah, and I, and I love that because like, I, they let me play with these models sometimes, and they're actually really fun to imagine the kind of things that you can do. So we started talking about GPT-4 Omni, but there's a lot of other models that we are, we're looking at right now. Eric, why don't we start with some of the, the cool things that are out today, and then Asha, maybe some ways that we're helping people use those things. I mean, some of the other things that we're excited to see today, you know, we announced the Phi series of models, Phi 3. We've got Phi 3 mini, small, and medium, which are 3, 7, and 14 billion parameter models. Uh, the thing about those Phi series models is, you know, we took a different approach to training them where we really tried to think of the data that they train on as like a curriculum, like you would give to a student where you're trying to teach the model, you know, step by step, how do we make it you know, learn everything about the world. And in doing that, we got a model that is much smaller and more powerful. So all the five three models, they basically punch a full weight class ahead for their size, which is really interesting as customers are looking for what's the most power that I can get from a model at the right price point. And so looking to select all sort of along that price performance curve, 
what are the places where the model's gonna work really well? And so it's exciting to see what we've done with that. We also added, uh, you know, Ash was talking about multimodal. Phi 3 for Vision is also yeah. available today. And so now you can, in these smaller models, still get those same rich vision capabilities that you're used to seeing with GPT-4V and GPT-O. Um, really excited to see that. We also expanded our partnership with Hugging Face, so there's a lot of open source models. We are also doing a lot around the tool chain, so I think that's what's most special. Eventually, we have to teach people to get the right model for the right job right. at the right cost, and if they can do that, then it's about the tool chain to build those applications. So we announced the general availability of Azure AI Studio, but we're also announcing a lot around responsible AI to keep those applications safe and secure end to end. So content filters, prompt shields, all of those things are going to become even more important as we start to scale. So as we look at this from a perspective of, of developers, like I, I might be like, oh, I got to use AI, I don't know what to do, because I, I've, I've been to conferences around the world and people are literally being told by their management, you need to use AI, and they're like, what? Yeah. And so what is some of the stuff that we provide to help developers get started? We'll start with you and then Asha. I mean, there's all these different tools that we, we make it, we built to make things easier. Um, you know, you can go to Azure AI Studio, which is the, the integrated place to go and build your generative AI applications. And you know, the most common pattern that we're seeing is this, you know, retrieval augmented generation, the rag pattern of how do I take some data and put it into a search engine, usually one that has vector search. And so that's why, you know, Azure AI search is super helpful for building those applications. It's a, a really rich search engine that brings all the power of vector search with all the things that we've learned over decades of doing keywords based search into a single platform uh, and then has a semantic ranker on top of them to really retrieve the most relevant results. And so then you feed that to your model that then the model now has all of the information um, for your application, just all that built into it. And so that's the pattern that developers are really going after. And so how do we make it easy for them to build that, to put all those pieces together, and then to start experimenting and iterating and, and, and learning like, all right, how do I tweak this to get the best quality out of it? It seems like some of the more sophisticated developers, once they do that, they're starting to turn to uh, tools to actually help them solve complex tasks. So assistance, assistant API, yeah. which we have from Azure OpenAI, that's becoming increasingly more popular. Popular. I saw Coca-Cola is doing something really cool where they have assistant API templates for every single department, so it makes it much easier than for a business decision maker to actually get started with the tools in a really you know, non-scary way. Yeah, and, and the cool, and did you want to say something? I was going to say, you even mentioned prompt shields, which we also yeah. didn't talk about. It's like the whole capability of building these tools responsibly and safely. Uh, you know, we provide the Azure Content Safety you know, system, uh, which is built into the Azure OpenAI service, and, and you can then add on to any other model that you want, but it gives you the full set of safety tools that you might want, things about how to you know, give different levels of control around you know, violence or sexual content, right. or how do you want to manage that, all the way to reducing hallucinations to managing prompt shields, which is really controlling jailbreak and things like that. So all those are just making the developer's life easier as they go and build these applications. So I want to lean in here just a little bit before we get to some of the other questions about safety and responsibility. Can you tell me how Microsoft is taking this particular task seriously in helping developers do it as well, Asha? Yeah, I mean, well, we've been working on it for the last eight years. So this is, you know, we, we think about this as cutting edge technology needs cutting edge responsibility. And we are still pretty early in it, but after eight years, we have 90 tools, hundreds of features, and we do a lot of the work ourselves. So before we release a model, there's a lot of work that we do to provide the, the Azure promise, but then we also provide tools so developers can actually customize their need, needs. So custom filters, is is a big feature that we released today, and that's allowing you to then set up different tools for moderation uh, for things that maybe we haven't even thought about yet. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, th and that's really cool. And th the thing that I think, now I want to dive into if it's possible, <laughs> is the notion of like what are customers doing with this? I know we spent a lot of time talking about, here's all this good stuff, goodness that we have, but what are customers doing? 
We'll start with you, Eric, and then maybe Asha, tell us a bit. I mean, we just keep telling all of the customer stories of all the amazing things that they're able to go and deliver on top of these tools, you know, and it's been in every industry uh, that we've, you know, really worked with. You see obvious cases in customer support where people are trying to, you know, build customer support bots to sort of help answer users' questions or even, you know, for their own agents to go and help them, you know, develop that. Um, but I think the interesting things are the new applications, the things that we just couldn't imagine being sort of lit up previously, and now seeing how those are coming to light with the way the customers are, are pulling all these different tools together in incredible applications. Um, some of the most interesting things are sort of this new space of having multiple agents sort of talk to each other and sort of string different conversations together. I think that's a really interesting space where we're starting to see, you know, the standard computer science abstractions and yeah. separation of control, like that's starting to materialize into these, these you know, much richer applications. Yeah, we now have uh, more than 53,000 customers that are on Azure AI, and one of the things that we're thinking deeply about is how do we start to do safety and security by default? So again, removing as much work as possible from our customers. The other interesting thing is that Microsoft runs on Azure AI, and so all of the co-pilots, all the millions of users, we're getting a first class ride at learning and using the technology for our customers internally, and then we put it in the platform and we extend it to our third party customers. So Microsoft has always been customer number zero, right? Uh, from literally from the start, I mean, when we first started building you know, out you know, our capabilities with the Azure OpenAI service, I mean, we first launched Bing Chat and then we launched M365, Copilot and, and GitHub Copilot even 18 months before that. So we've built all of that, as I just said, on the same platform that we make available to our customers so they know we've literally bet all of Microsoft business on it so they can trust it with their business as well. And that's awesome uh, because like I said, I, I use this stuff and I, I know what it does and every once in a while it's pretty surprising what you can do. And so as people are, are sort of getting immersed in the rag pattern and doing that kind of development and they're getting that to work, what are some things that people should look forward to or how should they orient their thinking when it comes to experiences that they may be able to develop? Yeah, I mean, one of the big things is I feel like we have to just be thoughtful to not do AI for AI's sake. It has to create real values. Yeah. So it has to improve the way you live, improve the way you work. There was a study that showed that skilled workers that use Gen AI are seeing a 40% improvement in the way that they work. And so, you know, we are constantly thinking about that from a product perspective, which is how do we build tools to help developers solve real problems? And so I would say don't lose sight of that. The second thing to look forward to is um, and we showed this in one of our sessions, we're moving much more code first. So we want to meet developers where they are. More and more we're seeing all applications becoming AI applications and we have the best IDs in the world. And so we want to make that really, really simple to wire up your applications, change out your models and do so without any thrash. I mean, I would add too, you know, Asha touched on multimodality earlier. This is something that we've been kind of seeing coming for a while, but really with GPT-4.0, it really brought home just how powerful this could be to have that much fluency with voice and, and sort of talking yeah. to a model and having it sort of talk back. And you know, there's sort of these inflection points in, on all technologies where suddenly you get to a point where it's good enough that it opens up scenarios that didn't used to previously work, right? In the you know, early 2000s, speech recognition had to be word at uh, time, yeah. and now it's much more natural for me to talk to my phone than to sort of swipe text messages. I think this level of vo voice fluency is going to change the way that we interact with, with you know, machines where we'll just talk much more naturally in our voice as opposed to doctoring things to you know, machine speak and sort of making it work that way. So I think that yeah. uh, combined with vision is going to be really interesting, the types of things that we can build. No, I was just going to say, I agree. In many ways, we've taught ourselves to prompt engineer queries for <laughs> right. search. And yeah. then, you know, your demo this morning was pretty amazing because it was just you expressing yourself to an application that now becomes you know, much smarter over time and can help you in any mode that you want, in any language that you want. And for those wondering, that actually, I coded that up. That's a real yeah, thing. I, it was, I know, it was this pretty, weekend. It's pretty amazing because like, as I was interacting with it, I, I, I like forgot the interface. Yeah. Like, I, it, it wasn't a keyboard thing anymore. So where, where should people go to get started with this stuff, Asha? Uh, Azure Studio is the best place. We have a playground, so you can just start to dabble with the models, and then you can consume the models. And so, 
that's a great place to get started. And any final thoughts from you, Eric, and then Asha? I mean, you know, there's so much happening in AI these days that the main thing for developers is they just have to get their hands wet. Like just, yeah. you know, yeah. dig in and start building something and just start to see what you can do with it. Because until you have that experience, until you're really seeing how things compose and how you can use it, you're just not going to have that full understanding. And so that's the main thing I would encourage people to do is go try these tools, go build applications, and uh, you'll be surprised at the power that you can really create with things. Asha, for me, last word. I mean, he took it. I feel like I just said <laughs> get started, but that's okay. No, I mean, I, I think that um, we just need to imagine the world as every application becoming an AI application. I, love I would it. say think at a much bigger scale than what we have before. Well, this has been amazing, and thank you so much for letting me work with you on these cool models. It's really exciting. Thank you so much, and we'll see you after this.